and then you think, then you think, um, where do you start? Um, you know, if you've got a big garden, where, where, where would you start? And um, it can be quite impersonal as well. And depending on the style of garden can be a bit uninviting. And I know um, perhaps lots of places have um, sort of big traditional gardens with lots of lawn, acres of lawn and lots of dark shrubs around the outside. And you think, well, ooh, what we're going to do with this? So this is about kind of kind of breaking down um, some of those kind of fears and uh, give you a bit of a start. Because nobody starts gardening on a large scale. No professional garden ever, gardener ever started on a large scale. And um, in fact, from my own experience, I think most of us, um, well, certainly I'm middle-aged, um, we started with doing things like fairy gardens and miniature gardens. You know, you made a little, you made a little model garden, and um, or you had a, cac a cactus collection at home. <laughs> that was how you started gardening. So I'm going to encourage you to think about gardening in a slightly different way and, and um, kind of ease yourself into it. So we're going to say start small, and um, before even touching a plant or considering um, having buying anything, um, I want you to think about exploring and engaging with plants um, through media. So have a look, there's lots and loads of lovely stuff out there for inspiration, gardening magazines and gardening books, and you can get gardening books really, really cheaply um, from charity shops. They're full of them. There's absolutely a cornucopia of different gardening books out there, so it's worth having a look. Um, you can get free seed and bulb catalogues if you go online and um, search for seed merchants and, and bulb suppliers and plant suppliers, they'll um, send you out free catalogues and they're fantastic to look through. Um, there's lots of gardening programmes on television and you can also get them on catch up, which is useful. Uh, so you can play them at a time that suits you. Um, and there's also great resources in um, BBC Gardener's World. They have online resources, which are fantastic. If you're uh, more okay with social media, then you can look up gardens on Pinterest and um, Instagram. In fact, my son sent me this link, which is um, a link to The Guardian, which has got the 20 best Instagram gardening accounts to have a look at, if you like a nice list to explore, go we'll have a look at that. And I'd also encourage you to use, um, to start with craft activities using natural materials because that gives you great opportunities for going out and collecting material outside, leaves and twigs and fruit and cones and all sorts of things that you might find outdoors um, in the woods or in the park or uh, in, in the garden. And you become comfortable with handling these materials. Um, and why I say that is because a lot of people have the misconception that things that you pick up in the garden and plants and soil are dirty and um, it's nice to just get your hands on them and understand that these things are not, are, they're not dirty, they're not any dirtier than human beings. So it's good to just get yourself, get yourself and your clients used to handling um, plant materials. It's a useful way of doing it. And why I'm asking you to do this is because you want to get inspired and you want to find things that you like, things that you dislike and these kind of things provide a hook into starting gardening. So for example, if you've been looking at um, this lovely Gardener's World uh, magazine and you think, wow, that's a fantastic flower on the front. I really, really love the look of this beautiful pink uh, dahlia. Um, you know, why not try growing one? You know, if, um, if you could pick this um, up uh, in, um, a little earlier on in the year, you would be in time to actually grow something like this. So it's about finding these hooks in finding people's likes and dislikes and your own likes and dislikes to kind of guide you to get a start to garden. So that's what that's about. And also I'm thinking that perhaps you might want to start up some kind of book club or um, TV club or hobbies club that allows you to introduce <coughs> these different kinds of media and gets you into thinking about gardening and the, and the outdoors. Okay, um, you can, I mean, it's something as simple as buying um, 
a bunch of flowers and arranging them in a vase. You know, it's that kind of thing. We're, we're getting down to very simple table things. Okay. So what I can say is you don't you don't need a garden. You don't need a garden to garden. You can do lots and lots of tabletop gardening, um, things you can do with your clients. As you know, if you've been following us, that you can do these things with your clients on a tabletop, indoors and outdoors. It's very adaptable. And there's lots of um, resources that can support you to do that. We have lots of activity sheets or fact sheets on our website that you can download and use. Um, we have seasonal gardening resource packs that you can buy from the Shelms online shop, which have um, dozens of different activities. We've got <clears throat> the Chelis YouTube channel where you can get lots of video help um, and how to sort of practical guides, how to do different activities there. And we have these live Zoom sessions, which you can join in too. And um, we are producing a gardening activities book, um, which has 52 activities in it, one a week for a whole year. So um, we're hoping to have that um, published in the next couple of months. So that's a great one to look out for. So, um, to, to think about. So starting small, you can start um, on a windowsill. And by that, I mean an indoor windowsill. Um, you don't have to have a window box outside. This is about growing indoors. And then um, you can make it a feast for the eyes, as I was talking about a vase of flowers, or a colourful, a colourful uh, pot plant. And um, a Japanese study has shown that you can reduce um, your blood pressure by having flowering plants in your room. So it's a lovely idea. Um, not only do you get a feast for your eyes, but you get your blood pressure uh, lowered at the same time. So what's not to like? Um, you can also think about growing things to eat on your windowsill. There's lots of stuff that you can do there. Um, you've probably all heard of growing cress. You can make that fun and see lots of different, different ways of doing that. You can have cress meadows and cress heads and all sorts of things. You can sprout seeds to uh, put in a stir fry. You can grow spring onions and um, you can grow herbs and spices. And in fact, Joan is going to be highlighting um, windowsill growing in the new year uh, on the 13th of January. Um, and uh, so that's going to be booking soon. So we're going to have a special on uh, windowsill growing uh, with a, a demonstration, a live demonstration. And it's uh, one of our growing series sessions. So we're going to have our occupational therapist, Jilly, there. And so she's going to be talking about lots of adaptations um, that you can make. Jilly's a, an OT specialist in dementia and um, lots of adaptations and how to engage with your clients. And there'll be a chance to ask questions at that session too. So um, what's happening there? So I need to click on to the next one. So growing herbs on your windowsill. So you could do this very easily. Um, and you can buy them as small plants from the supermarket, food aisle. Don't think that you have to go to a garden centre because actually the supermarket has these in stock all year round. Whereas the garden centre is a bit more seasonal when it comes to things like herbs and stuff like that. So you could have a bit of a theme going if you fancied. You could do uh, uh, Italian pizza toppings, you could have basil and thyme and oregano and rosemary and sage, or you could um, have a bit of an Indian um, theme and have coriander and ginger, mint, cardamom and curry leaf, just a few of the things that you could try growing on your windowsill. And uh, I love the way they've got them here in colanders. <laughs> It's terrific, but it looks like they've actually uh, not kind of lined the colanders. <laughs> and uh, so when they're pouring the water on, uh, the water's coming through the colander holes. So if you don't mind your windowsill getting wet, that's okay. <laughs> but you could have put in just a bit of a plastic bag or something just to stop the water coming through if you, if you wanted to do that and uh, not have it leak onto your windowsill. But uh, that's a lovely idea. I like the look of that. So, Thinking about um, taking people's eye outdoors, um, you've got you can have pot plants indoors, but how about having some pot plants outdoors? Some that like um, your outdoor climate. Have a table display outside, which is easily viewed from indoors. That's a great 
a great thing and it's it provides you can provide year-round interest with that and um, it's a lovely activity for someone to choose pots and put them out on the table um, or perhaps you know you could grow your own things or you could have a trip to the um, garden centre to choose some lovely pot plants to put outside um, and it's visual interest and you can use it to lure people outside you know you can say oh hey come on let's go out and uh, we'll have to you know deadhead the violas today they need deadhead and come out with me and help me do that you know it's a lovely way of kind of leading people outdoors you know you can stimulate their, in their interest from indoors and you can have a prompt conversation that's a great conversation starter so you're getting lots of social interaction and supporting people's well-being that way. Um, you're actually encouraging people to use their eyes. And we often forget this, that um, the eye is physically controlled by muscles. And so it's really important to get people to look close, get people to look into the middle distance and get people to look into the far distance. So if you've got something that's got a focal point outside, then you can direct them to be looking out there. So it's a really great exercise for your eyes and um, it's just a really interesting thing to do with people. And as I say, it's a hook to getting people outdoors. So even if they don't want to go out and take part in an activity, they might just be interested in the look of the plants and they get outside and they, if you have a, a nice seat by your table, you can sit out there and you can have a cup of tea and enjoy the outdoor fresh air and the sunshine. Um, so I would advocate having a having an outdoor table display. It's great, a great thing. So um, let's think about doorways. Um, you can create a floral display there to lift your spirits, and you can do all sorts of things with that. You can plant wildlife attracting plants, um, and all sorts of anything that takes your fancy, really, that you want to you want to put out there, and. Um, so not only does it provide a display welcoming you to come into the building, but it also provides you with um, something to lure you out of the building again. As I said, you could be not uh, looking at your table, but you could have the door open and look out and you're seeing this lovely display outdoors. And um, this could be the start of laying a trail of interesting um, visual and scented planters to attract people around the garden or over to certain parts of the garden that you'd like. So you could have a sort of, you could lay a trail um, to encourage people outdoors um, just from um, your doorway. So there's lots of things that you could be doing there with pots. Plants. Now you could grow edible flowers and uh, we touched on this earlier in the summer uh, in a live Zoom but there's loads of edible flowers that you can grow here very easily. Um, just to run through these common varieties, there's cornflowers, dahlias, hibiscus, honeysuckle, um, what have I forgot, magnolias, nasturtiums, pansies, roses, scented geraniums, and jasmine, which is a lovely scent as well. And you can get more information about edible flowers from Thompson and Morgan. They've got a great website where they've got this information. And so growing food can lead to all sorts of extension activities. Um, so you've got the caring for the plants themselves and looking after them. Um, you can enjoy seeing them grow and bloom. Um, you can harvest the flowers. In this case, you can make ice cubes with them. And then you can use your ice cubes and make mocktails and sit out in the garden and enjoy them. So there's a whole range of opportunities there to engage people uh, and to um, get them interested in gardening. Um, back to doorways again. Um, it's great, you can grow salad um, at your, in fact, at your, if you have a kitchen back door, I think that's a great place to put some salad because it's really within easy reach. Um, if you're making a, a salad, you're making a sandwich, you can nip out and uh, pick some lettuce or whatever it is that you like to grow spring onions are great you can snip them and put them in your in your sandwiches um, and re it's really easy and it's there and it's just there and it's convenient and that's what makes it work you know so um there's lots of opportunity for to grow things in pots there at your kitchen door 
Um, plants and pots need weekly or daily care, so watering, feeding, deadheading, harvesting. So those are all excellent opportunities to interact with nature and also to feel that you're doing a valuable task. So lots of opportunities there to engage people um, in these things. And um, these pots are on the ground, but you can easily lift the pots up onto a table um, if people have difficulty in bending. So it's quite, you can adapt it for um, physical attributes. You can put them up on a table so people can see them more closely. It's at hand and um, they're easy to handle and easy to pick as well when you do that. So that's another example. So if we want to move beyond the doorstep and you're getting a bit braver and you've you've got a few pots that you might want to, to use, you can think about developing a little garden area if that takes your fancy. And it doesn't have to be large at all. Um, this space uh, measures about three meters by two meters and which is the size of a large rug. You know, it's not big. And um, so it's easy to just uh, have this. And this, this space is uh, literally um, beside it's actually beside an entranceway as well, so it, make, it makes it easy to see and invites you to come and sit in. So this space is west facing, so it gets the sun in the afternoon. So you wouldn't want to develop a space like this if you wanted somewhere for everybody to go for a cup of coffee in the morning, because it would just be cold and drafty and not nice. So you have to think a little bit about the aspect of the space that you're um, developing. But this one is west facing, so you get the sun in the afternoon and the evening, and um, it's nice and bright. And it's got paved ground, which is um, hard paving, so it dries up very quickly after rain, which is useful. Um, so it's not wet and uh, grassy. Um, we've got weatherproof seating there, so that can be out all year round. Um, and you can take out a seat pad to make it more comfortable if you want, um, when it's dry. Um, these chairs are sturdy and they have arms so people can easily get in up and down from them. So if you want to encourage some independent movement of people going out to the garden you've got to make it easy for them to do it. So, um, so if you've got people that are a bit infirm and a bit shaky, um, these kind of chairs are great. They're, they provide them with um, enough stability and um, independence they can get up and down there. So we've got that. Um, we've also got a small table. A table's really useful, it doesn't have to be a big table. This one's just quite tiny and sits in between and you can put down your um, cup of tea or your uh, glass of uh, gin or whatever you're having uh, on that. And it's a good place for all, uh, also displaying plants as well. You can put a plant and you can put your plants on. Okay. So uh, a few other features here. We've got on the uh, left hand side, I've got a very big planter there and it contains, it's got a trellis attached to it, which is about, um, about eight foot high. So you can grow things up it and it actually acts as a bit of a screen to what, what is next to it, which is a wall. So it makes it lovely and green. You can grow things up vertically up it. So we've got, uh, I've got roses and clematis growing up here and they're there all year round. So they provide a nice green screen. Um, and the roses have got a lovely smell. Um, also got some lavender in here, so that attracts bees and it uh, smells good too. So you can take, pick some or rub your hands on it and get a lovely scent of lavender. Um, we've also got here, we can bring in pots to uh, bring in seasonal colours. So this is um, geraniums and there's a pelargonium here on the seat. And then round this side on the right, we've got some other pots with um, various flowers in it. But I've also got this big pot here, which is a bay tree, which is about six foot high. And that has been in there for, oh, I don't know, quite a few years now, probably about five years. And it, it grows really well in Scotland. Um, it can't take very, very, very cold temperatures, but the past five years we haven't had a, a winter that's killed it, so it's been fine. Um, and it just gives a bit of shelter because you don't want to sit anywhere where you're kind of right, you feel like you're out in the elements. It's lovely to have a bit of shelter, the shelter of the, um, the plant beside you. So you can sit in there and it shelters you from the worst of the west of the wind 
and it also makes you feel you've got a little bit of kind of cover above your head because it's it's taller than you so it feels quite nice it kind of gives you a little a little hug um, in there so you can bring the pots in to give you lots of different color and interest and you could pile loads of them in there and um, i don't have too many because we actually put a barbecue in there we can put the chairs out and put a barbecue in there so it kind of has a double function and um, so it's quite useful to keep your um little garden adaptable for these kind of things so what makes a good spot you know you can't just plonk down a chair or a bench anywhere and uh, expect people to use it it's got to be quite inviting so um i liked i really like this picture because i thought oh, i could quite, quite like to kind of nestle down in there that looks quite nice to me so um, so this was it this was my um, my little example but what makes a good spot well it's good to be accessible all year round or as much of the year as you can make it so um it's got to be dry um, and it's got to be the seat's got to be dry and the underfoot area has got to be dry so that people don't worry about getting their feet wet when they go in or sitting down on something damp and cold um, it's got to be sheltered uh, but that doesn't mean it necessarily mean it has to have a roof um, you can have it without a roof but you can have your planting so that it kind of creates a little sort of bower shape so that it keeps the worst of anything rain off or whatever um, or you could have canvas. It'd be quite nice if you had a seat with, um, thinking of everybody in lockdown has had, um, oh gosh, what do you call these um, things? They're tents with outside. <laughs> I forget what they're called. Gazebo. <laughs> gazebo, gazebo, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, lovely. So you could have a gazebo over your, over your bench or your seating area and have lots of plants and pots inside your gazebo and that'd be lovely. It'd give you a little bit of cover but still let you see the wider uh, space. And um, so you could have a gazebo or you could have um, a sail, one of these sails that you put up the sort of um, triangular in shape and you can attach them um, to the walls and posts and that gives you a bit of shade and they look quite smart if you, if you like that kind of modern design look. So um, that was it. So you want a, bit of, a good bit of shelter um, and plant into Get the worst, keep the worst of the oops, sorry, the worst of the weather conditions off. You could always choose. You can all also choose your spot if you have a spot in the in your garden or grounds that is gets the sun for a lot of the day, and you could pop a chair out there or a couple of seats out there, um, and that allows you to to sort of like be really opportunistic. And that the seat, the seat and everything's still always there in the sunspot and you can nip out and just have that 10 minutes with a cup of coffee or if you're walking around if you're walking around the garden with the clients and the sun is out and you think oh right you could just have 10 minutes sitting here in the sun that's lovely so it's really nice to have identify a place in your garden with that um, with the sun that gets the sun most of the day and of course you're planting you Choose your planting to create atmosphere and give you pleasure in your small space. Um, and uh, there's lots of ways of doing that. And there's lots of different styles that um, you could, you could con consider. Um, so this one's very exotic and uh, lush and lovely. And um, there's all sorts of things. Here's another, here's another type here. So this is a different style and wood. This is a sort of more of a cottage garden and it's more informal. And there's, there's colour and there's soft colours and it's very verdant and kind of relaxed. So that's another sort of way of thinking about planting. You could emulate that with lots of different plants. Or you could go for a more oriental style with lots of leafy greens. It can be quite structured and that can be quite calming. You can have, create very calm effects with this. It's not there's not competing colours or or anything kind of glaring there. There's lots of just different shades and coolness. And we've also got um, a sort of a more contemporary style here. This is very bold and dramatic. And um, this is a row of pots. And uh, what's really interesting here is, I think there's about five pots in this picture. I can't quite see. But, um, it's it's this repetition of the same pattern and that's really really striking 
and it's really useful to um, you can use that in your garden um, to um, create um, to put structure into your planting and sort of draw attention to something. This is this is uh, these pots are sitting along um, a wall, um, and the wall is next to a path. And it's early springtime, so the the trees, which you can just see the trunks of, there are no leaves in the trees there. And so your attention is taken by these beautiful splash of colour here that runs along the wall top. So it's a real feature and it's lovely. I'm sure it, it must draw a lot of attention and comment. So it's a very, it's a useful thing if you want to highlight something or just make a real impact. Think about the colour and the boldness of it. Um, it's great. Now there's instructions in the, the giveaway book that I'm going to talk about in a minute about this. Um, and there's also uh, about planting bulbs and you can also get more information about planting bulbs in the Trellis Live Zoom Autumn Planter video, which has good um, information about planting a sort of bulb lasagna within a, a container. Uh, so you can have a look at that if you want to learn more about it. So here's another um, style as well, Mediterranean style, where it's really bright and vivacious and exciting and, ooh, and warm. <laughs> so um, here they're using uh, the wall space to create the garden. And um, so they're fixing lots of containers on the wall space and filling them with, it uh, looks like um, geraniums here. Lots and lots of geraniums for colour. And um, if you're interested in this kind of planting and you want to, um, be inspired, you can um, either take a trip to um, Spain in May uh, to Cordoba because they have a fantastic patio festival that looks wonderful. So the whole town opens up their patios to the public and you can go around and visit them all. Um, if you can't get to Spain, um, you can go virtually to uh, online and uh, that's the link there. Um, but uh, you could Google it by putting in the Cordoba Patio Festival and you get to see lots and lots of fabulous inspiration there. And that's another idea for you. Um, so we're talking about wall space there. We've got um, our hanging basket. Um, you can think about hanging baskets. You can, um, in springtime, you could create one with fruit and veg in it. It's going to hang outside. And um, there's, we have a hanging baskets video uh, in our U on our YouTube channel. So um, you can do fruit, veg and flowers and all in a basket or a container. So have a go at that. So what all this small space gardening has in common is that we're growing pots, uh, plants in pots. And that's called container growing. And um, so this week's giveaway is a terrific book by the BBC gardener Alan Titchmarsh and it's a terrific step-by-step -step practical guide and it's just pitched really well in that it's got enough information, enough hard information to give you all the detail that you need but not too much, it's not overwhelming and it's got lots of uh, very well illustrated steps and practical guidance into how to actually plant things up. So everything from selecting the pot to caring for the plants and how to do address things like if you've got an ugly corner in your garden, how you could perhaps use your container planting to make that look better. Uh, and all sorts of interesting tips and uh, ideas. But also it has a fantastic um, 30 pages worth of um, colour photos of suggested trees, shrubs and plants for all different seasons and situations that you can grow in containers. And uh, who knew there were so many things that you could actually just grow in containers? Fantastic. So loads and loads of inspiration there um, that you can uh, draw on. So it's uh, really worthwhile getting your hands on it. So uh, what could we learn from Alan? Well, I think his big message is to get the best display, you've got to keep your plants happy. That's uh, what it's all about. Um, so consider the season um, and the plant's preferences. So if you can match up the plant's preferences with the conditions that you're going to be growing it in, that's the best thing that you can do. So if you want to provide interest in a specific season, you choose a plant um, that thrives in your conditions. So you want to consider how light or dark it is, how dry or wet it is, how cold or warm it is. 
and you can choose a plant um, that's putting on its floral leaf bark or scent display in that season. Um, so just now we're coming into uh, autumn. Uh, sorry, we're in autumn and we're coming into winter. So that's the kind of plants, the plants that are going to be showing their best at that time of year. You don't pick them just now. So um, this planter has a few things in it that um, you could use at this time of year. So there's um, a Carex grass in the centre. There's a pink cyclamen flower here. There's a viola, which is, uh, gives you a lot of scent and colour uh, there. And the filler is um, this little evergreen linicera, and it will grow and expand and spill over the side. So it's a spiller. Uh, if you're going for the thriller, filler, spiller, um, this is the spiller, and it grows beautifully over the side. It's very soft and it's evergreen as well. So it keeps a bit of structure there um, when all things might um, be dying off which means that you could keep the grass and the lanicera and then in the springtime you could change it for you could swap the flowering plants out for things that um, do well in the spring and um, so it's quite a nice way to um, keep the structure of the plant. So consider the hardiness of plants uh, especially here in Scotland and we're thinking about the winter time uh, and always look at the label because it will give you an indication of what kind of conditions it likes to grow in. There's a thing called the hardiness scale, so that tells you how hardy the plant is and if a plant is hardy it will stand very cold conditions. So in the Scottish weather you want something that's uh, on the hardiness scale between four and five and that will just keep it, um, keep it absolutely uh, frost resistant and won't be killed at all. Um, so the scale runs from H1A to H5, with H5 being the hardiest. So the higher the number, the hardier it is. Um, you can find more about H ratings uh, on the RHS website. Um, and I just wanted to show you this picture because I thought it was lovely. This is a planter that, um, that's been frosted. It's, it's um, The picture's been taken on a, on a lovely frosty morning. So you can see that lovely Carex grass has um, been frosted all over. So it's beautiful, all this lovely frosty Looking, and the ivy as well, I think that looks terrific um, when it's frosted. It all looks beautiful. So um, bear that in mind, what's it going to look like on a cold, on a cold frosty morning? And uh, of course a touch of frost in it, it can make it look beautiful. And uh, another lovely thing to look at and um, consider and draw to your client's attention. So I'm just going to wrap it up there. I'm going to say, have a go. Have a go with whatever appeals to you, which is really what we're trying to say. And um, you know, anything at all. This is a lovely terrarium with uh, some succulents in it. You can you would have this inside. It wouldn't take much care at all. Succulents are very self-sufficient and hardly need any water. So if you want something that looks good and um, you don't have to give it much attention, then this is ideal. Um, it's got all this lovely dinosaur garden there. So all the dinosaur and some beautiful coloured um, stones so I think that looks terrific. So have a go at whatever appeals. Um, you get lots of free information and support from Trellis. We assume no knowledge is required and or if you want to refresh your skills, you have someone you want to refresh them, you can use our Trellis Live Zoom with our free giveaways. We can support you to garden. We've got um, online training in um, seasonal gardening at our seasonal gardening activities programme if you want to do some further CPD. Um, it's a great programme, it runs all year round. Um, the winter session starts in December and um, each unit uh, lasts for 12 weeks. So um, the winter unit's coming up. Um, and hopefully next year we can meet you in person because we're planning a range of networking events um, across the country and um, with um, Sort of specialist client groups. So for example we're going to be uh, doing one with uh, children and young people, a networking event concentrating on those kind of gardening activities and what we can do. Uh, one with um, people in care settings and another one which is escapes me now. Oh no, learning disability. Uh, we're going to be concentrating on that too. So a whole range of client groups there, hopefully uh, coming up in 2022. Um, so I'm going to encourage questions. 
on small space gardening, on barriers to gardening, on engaging clients and staff. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jenny. That was really interesting. I've been like scribbling lots of wee notes down here as I've been going along as well. Um, I have one question for you um, from Anne. Um, she's wondering how to get the indoor growing herbs that you suggested buying from the supermarkets all year round to grow outside. So dividing them up and then keeping them going outside. Right. <laughs> well, that's a case of... Um picking ones that like the conditions outside. At this time of year, it's maybe a wee bit trickier. Easier to do this in springtime, I would say, because most of these herbs like it a bit warmer. So I would say, yes, your outdoor, your time for putting them outside is in the spring. And it's a process of what's known as hardening off. So it's a case of putting them outside on, in nice weather and bringing them in if it's going to be frosty at all. And giving them a few weeks of of that. Would you agree, Joan? Is that kind of a way to, yeah. to go about? It? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, especially in the winter time, you know, the plants that are coming into the supermarkets have been grown in indoor conditions, possibly even abroad. I don't know, I can't say where they come from, but definitely they've been grown on in indoor conditions. And during our winter time, regardless of how mild it is, it's, if it's very mild, it means we're getting lots of rain. So most herbs are Mediterranean in their origins, so they like it dry. So Jenny's suggestion of hardening them off in the springtime to grow outside in the summertime would be your best way of getting them to survive the following winter time. Absolutely. And um, but I've had actually quite a lot of success with um, these kind of herbs because we did this um, at the at spring this year. I planted them up in a big planter outside. I didn't take them inside because it was spring and the weather was going to be, you know, the weather was good. And uh, they grew, I mean, they just grew fantastically well. So they're in a south facing wall so they get lots of heat and sunshine but they do do well if you can if you can put them outside at the in the spring um i think it's jill has shared a, just a wee comment here to remember to keep the you mentioned paving and it's good for drying off on a if it's following the rain, Jenny. Yeah. Um, Jill's picked up on that saying, remember to keep the surfaces clean as flowers that drop petals can potentially pose a, a slip hazard, yeah. which is a really valid point. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and um, if you're a fan of, well, yeah, I mean, just brushing them up. But if you're a fan of the pressure washer, that's a, a good one as well. <laughs> if you like that kind of thing. It's great, um, it's a great job for somebody to go out and do actually, have a go with that. I think some of the men, some of the men love a, you know, they love a pressure washer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll maybe pick up on um, the, the paving that you mentioned, Jenny. Um, decking is a really quick way of uh, dealing with varying levels and things like that. And people see it as a, a quick fix. It's really attractive. But depending on the setting, um, decking is can be quite lethal if it's not really maintained gosh, almost weekly. Um, if anybody has decking at home, they might be aware that it gets really slippy if it's been wet and in the winter time when mm -hmm. like there's like it's a sheet of ice. Um, so um, be wary of if somebody offered you your decking, weigh it up and maybe put off the job for another six months while you can afford to buy a slightly safer um, surface for your client group to work on. Mm. Question here, Jenny, are geraniums a good bet for longer lasting colour? Yes, I would say so. They have a long, a long um, flowering time. And the great, the thing about geraniums is you've got to keep deadheading them. And it looks really cruel, right? But if you spot, <laughs> if you spot the geranium, you've got the whole geranium head. And if you spot more than a third of it dying back, whip that off because you'll get far more flowers if you do that it'll keep going and keep going I've got geraniums outside just now that are still blooming and we're in November so I say go for it if you're a fan of the geranium go for it <laughs> yeah absolutely 
And um, Mary is suggesting rosemary uh, as a pretty hardy um, herb slash shrub for yeah. our Scottish climate. And it looks lovely um, when there's snow on it, which yeah. is, is nice. Word of warning there. Sorry, Jenny, I'm going to start blithering <laughs> now. Um, if we do get snow landing on top of your shrubs in the winter time, and as Jenny says, the last couple of winters, we've not had a hard winter at all. And shrubs don't mind a, a covering of snow on top of them. What they don't like is if it freezes. So if we know it's going to snow and we know it's going to all be away by tomorrow night, then don't worry about it. If it's going to snow and the weather forecast man tells us it's going to be a hard frost, go out with your brush and just like kind of shiggle the, the shrubs a little bit to break, to loosen off most of that snow. And it means when it freezes, it won't freeze the snow round about the shrub, which can be problematic for something like a rosemary. So just, just be aware of, of that. And uh, again, Jill saying carnations are great plants to use. So, yep, we would agree. Yeah, with oh, they're great. Yeah. And you can cut them and bring them in. Well, you can cut all sorts of flowers and bring them in as well um, for a vase. And that's great. And rosemary, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> delicious <laughs> and roast potatoes is my favourite. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots of opportunities to interact with the rosemary. And it smells lovely. You can you, you can you can pick the rosemary and kind of tie it together with an elastic band or a bit of string, and uh, dangle it under the hot bath tap and run your bath with mm -hmm. the rosemary. And it's lovely. It smells gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> and rosemary is great for taking cuttings off of as well. So yeah, great suggestion. Rosemary. Everybody should have a rosemary. Yeah, totally. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions or points or um, share their favourite plant that they've got growing in a pot, perhaps in their own garden, their own door at home or in their workplace? <laughs> Just unmute yourself and shout out. Dell looks great. I've got Dell in a container at the moment, which is huge and it's still got lots of lovely little fronds on it and the the seed heads just look really nice so it's I mean it's still there and it's November so it's one that's that's quite good it's lasted a long time it's cool how long have you had that growing in your pot for quite a few years no no just this year okay. just this year yeah no but it's it's lasted you know it was planted from seed Oh, and yeah. it's there now and it's about three feet high so it looks lovely. Wow. Maybe drape uh, by yourself, treat yourself to some fleece, um, horticultural fleece out the garden centre or even the pound shop sometimes have them and you know you might, it might help it over winter if you give it a little bit of um, cover. Who knows? Maybe worth a try. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, I've got um, house leeks on my front step, um, amongst some other pots. I've got a I've got a rosemary in a terracotta pot, which is awfully nice, and I've got some house leeks in a tray. They're good because they're very pretty and they survive in very shallow soil, and they've um, they've just kept going all through winters and all the seasons. You just see them there doing their thing. Um, so that's that's a really nice display. This year they've they've flowered, but even when they're more dormant, they're still green, you know. Yeah, they're so pretty, aren't they? They look like little jewels. I always think when you see them in a, in a ma on mass, they're just so intricate. And just yeah, lovely, aren't they? They're yeah. very pretty. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, you look like you've got some things behind you there, Rebecca. That's <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'm in the office at the moment, and we actually we've got uh, we've got quite a few nice plants about. I think yeah, there's we'll some money, that. money plants and some and a spider plant back there. Lovely. Um, one of my colleagues is growing a basil plant and a mint plant in the office as well, which is awfully nice. Cool. I know it's nice. It's lovely to get a little a piece of somebody's plant, isn't it, and be able to stick it in a in a um, pot of soil and see if it roots for you or stick it in water and see if it roots and 
be able to create another pot plant. It's a lovely, a lovely thing to do. Don't yeah. you me with something here? <laughs> I see a spider plant with yeah, many yeah. babies. <laughs> That's lovely. We can't hear you. <laughs> I know it's not John. It's Jill. <laughs> it's Jill. Hi, Jill. <laughs> I think you're muted. That's why we can't hear you. See if you can unmute. <laughs> no worries, but you could you could um, pot up all these lovely little baby spider plants. That's nice. Yeah, we've got a house plant come session coming up, Jenny. I can't remember the day off the top of my head. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to turn around. It's the first, second Tuesday. No, it must be the first work Thursday in January. January yeah. I don't even know when Christmas and New Year's fall, so I can't even guess the date. That's it it, yeah, be, it's early. early January. Six, it's the sixth of January. We're doing a house plant session. Yep. Yeah, that would be good fun. Nice. Cheery indoor New Year plants. That's what we want. <laughs> In fact, okay. I'm looking forward to my. I've got a Christmas cactus. Oh. Uh, sorry, an Easter cactus, but then it started blooming at Christmas as well. So I'm delighted. I'm getting two blooms a year out of it, which is very surprising. <laughs> yep. So lots of let me share lots of nice things like that come January. Oh, Jill's told us that she sells them. She, she must pot up her baby spiders and she pots them up and sells them for charity. So they are they're a fabulous wee plant. Um, a great introduction to house plants. If you are if you always kill them, let's say, try a spider plant and um, they tend to not thrive and neglect, but they, they don't require a lot of um, TLC. Yeah, cool. So that's great. <laughs> Anybody else get any questions um, specific to um, small space gardening um, or perhaps gardening in general? Uh, fantastic. Oh, Mandy's talking about square foot gardening. And um, in the chat. Yep. Yeah, that is a good method. And um, I think we've actually got a fact sheet on square foot gardening mm -hmm. in the Trellis Library. So if you want to know more about it, you can. Yeah, it's, it's a great way to get people going in a tiny space. Yeah. Have you done so... that, Mandy? <laughs> Sorry? Have you done a lot of square foot gardening? I haven't done a lot. I it did it. I mean, I've, you know, I've sort of been, you know, I finished my job. It was four years ago, so it's a while since I've done anything really like that. Um, but yeah, we, we did do it and we adapted it a bit for slightly bigger spaces. You know, we sort of had like square square two foot gardening if you wanted to plant a few. Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually used it for myself a bit as well, because when you grow food just for one, you, uh -huh. I tend to get carried away and I sow all this seed because I just love sowing seed and growing things. Um, mm -hmm. And it's too much so I try and limit myself like that um, or I end up giving lots of food away <laughs> which is fine too. <laughs> yeah it's really a nice way isn't it to, to limit the yeah. space and so that it's not overwhelming for people to just it is, yeah. Yeah. yeah and use the vertical space as well with the I don't know tall plants and you know the edibles as well um, using using your layers that's a good way as well sort of Corn and squash underneath and things growing up. Yeah, it's because it? it's, it's three dimensional. Yeah, it's great. I like doing that. I like small, the challenge of a small space. Mm. It's good. Yeah. Cool. We, Lorna is suggesting, um, well, we did touch on collecting seed saving tomato seeds um, a couple of sessions ago. So she's um, saving the seeds from tomatoes drying them and then sewing them on, um, germinating them and sewing them, growing them on your window ledge and also, you know, dried peas on tissue paper on the window ledge. They'll certainly start off that way. Um, I'm growing some pea shoots at the moment for our session that we're doing on windowsill growing. So I've got some photos of the before and after to share with you. So there, that's great recommendations. Thank you. Um, Susan's asking for recommendations on places to purchase large pots in bulk. Um, depends what you mean by bulk. If you are 
talking really big bulk, I would suggest um, getting in touch with the likes of Clydeside um, Trading. Clydeside Trading. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Clydeside Trading, they, they sell them singly, but they also sell them in bigger packages in bulk that you would maybe get a half decent price on. So Clydeside, we'll put that in the, we'll share a link to them, okay. Clydeside Trading and the email that we'll send out with all the links next week. Yeah. Um, go online. I mean, it's amazing. Even if you sort of like do some Amazon Google checks, um, it's amazing what I've managed to find. Even if you're only looking for 10 or something, you sometimes get better prices on there. Or just go and speak to your local garden centre or wholesale nursery if you've got one nearby and just say, listen, I'm looking for 20 of these pots. What's your best price? If you don't ask, you don't get. That's um, a good way of looking at it. But also at this time of year, some of the garden centres are trying to clear out all their stock so they can make space for even more Christmassy um, goods. So you might pick up a bargain there also. Um, da -da -da. Can all the plant sales? Oh yeah, uh -huh. Jill's suggesting that we have a plant sale outside our house for charity. There was a lot of that going on last year during COVID, wasn't there? You saw bits and bobs happening. Um, bags hanging outside the window ledge to grow salad leaves. Now that's a great idea. Yeah. If um, you're not in a multi-storey flat to know that it's <laughs> dripping down onto your neighbour's ledges below. But I like that idea. Um, to grow salad leaves, that would definitely work, especially if you're sort of southwest facing. Um, oh, uh, Morrison's being queued, they will supply pots for you for free. Yep. Um, if you're a charity, definitely go in and ask these places. If they can't give you them for free, they'll certainly give you um, a discount, that's for sure. Yep. Great suggestions. Thanks very much, folks.